So good morning, everyone. It is really our honor and privilege to talk with you today about reducing anxiety around surgery, endoscopy, and fusions. We are just so glad you are joining us here today on this wonderful Saturday morning. My name is Kimberly Hare. I'm a gastroenterologist here at the University of Michigan. My research focuses primarily on understanding the overlap of GI disorders and psychology. I'm now going to turn it over to my co-presenter, Sandra, who is going to introduce herself and kick off the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, really great to be here. Super excited. This is such a great event um, that Dr. Higgins is hosting. Um, love the format of having um, uh, healthcare professionals and patients co-present together and really bridge the gap and share the experiences and understand um, our various perspectives and expertise. Um, so my name is Sandra Zielinski. I am a graduate of the Patient and Community Engagement Research Program out of the University of Calgary. Um, and I have been living with Crohn's disease for about 27 years now. Um, about seven years ago, I was forced to sell my business and um, this gave me time on my hands. And so I ended up taking this course. Research is not my background at all. But now here I am in this space of really trying to bring the collective patient voice um, to healthcare, to health research, um, so that we hear from our um, important perspective and expertise. And so when um, I got paired up with Dr. Hare, I thought, okay, I'm going to go see if she's on Twitter to see if I can learn a little bit more about her. And I found, um, I found her on Twitter, and on her Twitter site, <laughs> She has uh, a post in her in her um, uh, profile, I guess, about her love for mushroom hunting. And so I thought, oh, wow, this is a great match. I have also done a lot of mushroom hunting. So we have connected over mushroom hunting. And you'll find um, throughout our slides we have, we're inviting you to join on a virtual mushroom hunt. And we have a little mushroom in every slide. So have fun finding them with us and um, and yeah, next slide. So today we'll be covering um, the topic around anxiety and um, or reducing anxiety in surgery and endoscopy and infusion. So we'll really just kind of go into the normalcy of anxiety um, when going into surgery or endoscopy or infusions and these will vary from person to person. Am I a bit quiet? Um, and then we will talk about the patient experiences and some tips and tricks to help you through um, some of these phases. Next slide. So we're going to start off with a poll um, and we would like to ask the audience, have you ever experienced anxiety prior to surgery, endoscopy, or infusion? We'll give you 20 seconds. So the poll is up and you have four choices. And it's, I've experienced anxiety, I've experienced depression, I've experienced both anxiety and depression, and neither is your fourth one. So we'll see how that's going. We're currently collecting responses. About half of the people have voted. If you can, just try to get your vote in in the next, say, 10 seconds, and then we'll close the poll and show you the results. Two, one, two, three. So I'm going to wrap this up. We've got a uh, majority voted, so we'll call that a quorum and share the results. So results, we have 50% of people that have identified experiencing anxiety, 4% um, who have uh, spoken or have indicated that they experienced depression um, around some of these, uh, so surgery, endoscopy, or infusions, and then 40% um, who have expressed both anxiety and depression, and then 13% um, that have expressed that. They have not experienced either. So overall, um, we have 
it looks like it's a, as we suspected, sort of a normal, um, somewhat normal reaction to entering into some of these procedures. Next slide. So we also took the poll over to Twitter um, and we asked the same question, um, except for our answers were yes or no. Um, so we had 89 votes um, for this Twitter poll and 85.4% of people indicated that yes, um, they have experienced some sort of anxiety prior to surgery, endoscopy or infusions. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into some of the feedback and suggestions that patients um, spoke about some tips to help deal with that a little bit later in, in the presentation. So next slide. So it is normal. Anxiety is normal. I don't think any of us sign up to go in for surgery like we want to go for surgery or we want to go for a colonoscopy or an ileoscopy. ileoscopy. So I think there is certainly a normalcy to kind of resisting <laughs> some of these um, procedures. Exactly. So as both polls showed, it's very common to have anxiety regarding procedures and testing. Um, and we actually have evidence to show that. So studies have shown that about 7% of people are afraid of bladder injections, and this is like true phobia level um, fear. So there's obviously more people who have less severe fear as well. A third of patients have anxiety prior to colonoscopy, and about 80% of patients have anxiety prior to surgery. So we know anxiety surrounding procedures and infusions is incredibly common, but why is it important to identify and treat pre-procedural -pre anxiety? Well, one reason is that higher pre-procedural anxiety is associated with increased post-procedural pain. Also, patients such as those with IVD who undergo endoscopy for a specific symptom or reason experience higher anxiety compared to those undergoing just standard screening. Finally, anxiety can be a res or can result in avoidance of procedures or treatment. This was highlighted a bit before, but this avoidance can lead to negative consequences such as delayed diagnosis or inadequately controlled disease. I like the picture on this slide because oftentimes people love to say, don't panic or calm down in a situation in which anxiety is certainly a reasonable response. Panic and anxiety are definitely a normal response to things such as an empty toilet paper roll. However, instead of just saying, don't panic, or relax, this presentation aims to discuss common causes of anxiety and then provide you with some tools that you can use to manage the anxiety associated with surgery, endoscopy, and infusions. I'm now gonna pass it over to Sandra to discuss more specifically some different causes of anxiety surrounding surgery, endoscopy, and infusions, specifically for patients with IBD. So some of the potential concerns related to procedural anxieties um, can really range from person to person. And um, I know from my own experience as well, a lot of these um, I've experienced myself. So it's not just like one specific thing. And I think I've experienced um, different levels of anxieties for each category actually. So surgery, endoscopy, and infusions. Um, and for all different reasons, and those things have changed over time as well. So for example, with infusions, um, because I've been living with Crohn's disease for a, quite a long time, um, I've had lots of IV infusions, and over the years, my veins are, have gotten tired, and it's become harder and harder to access my, my veins. So I, have, I never used to have anxiety going in for IV infusions, um, and then over time with some of these complications that have come up for me, it's, I, can, I do feel that response where I'm starting to feel anxious of like, how is this going to go? Are they going to be able to access my vein? How many nurses are going to have to give it a go? Um, and just sort of that general overall feeling of like, oh gosh, please let this be a first time access because it, it is a, a stress inducing um, anxiety. And in fact, you know, maybe a little off topic, but it's actually sort of played into some of my treatment decisions as one of my top um, factors is I would prefer a subcut subcutaneous injection at this point because of the anxieties around IV. 
Um, and then when I look at surgery, for me, that's my greatest anxiety. And I think speaking to Dr. Higgins earlier was talking about if you've had some complications post-surgery and things that have happened, um, that stuff like that comes up again. So I've had, you know, infections after surgery and lots of different things that have gone on that have, have really caused um, some stress, I would say. And so now going into it, I'm always I try not to leave it till the last minute, but it's really, it's really a challenge. I really need my GI to like, to really push me in there and say, listen, just stay. We need this <laughs> because I have a, a lot of stress around um, surgery. I've had like, you know, wounds open right up post-surgery and just all these things that um, you feel like, oh God, is this going to happen again? Do I have to go through this all over? And bowel surgery is not fun. I mean, I've had other surgeries that have been almost uh, I would say a walk in the park compared to bowel surgery. So, um, and then, you know, things like um, over, if if we get into that sort of surgical mode and if you have complicated disease, that potentially you've had several surgeries and then you start worrying, okay, am I gonna end up with short bowel syndrome? Every time I have a surgery, my transit time is quicker. Um, I, I don't wanna face this, you know, um, those types of things. So it's really, working through all this because you, you do need to deal with it you do you need you need to manage your disease and um you can't leave it till the last minute because usually that's um makes the healing process even harder if you wait till you're really sick so so um you know th some other factors people might worry about pre going into say surgery if you're going to be gone away from your home for a longer period of time is like child care and who's going to take care of the kids and who's going to manage the house and who's doing the laundry and all these stresses that, um, you know, I often say living with a chronic disease, it filters into every aspect of your life. It's not just a compartment where you can leave that behind and then go and deal with another part of your life. You really have to manage all aspects of your life living with a chronic disease at the same time. So, you know, all these concerns can really come up um, in the midst. So next slide, please. So some of the, um, these are some of the responses to our poll, because um, we also asked for people to share some recommendations and some of the tips that other IBD patients use um, during, uh, or tr to try to cope with anxiety around surgery, endoscopy, and infusions. And so, for example, we have some patients um, so in, in relation to surgery that use med meditation and speak about sort of the universe taking care of them and, and trying to visualize that going into surgery. Injections, um, somebody spoke about putting their headphones on and playing really loud music um, and taking deep breaths before they inject. And I'm assuming that was a Humira injection because I know how painful those are. Um, colonoscopies, we had um, one person talk about, he's a truck driver, so it, was, it just wasn't practical to do this prep and then be on the road. So he would start really early doing a three, four day liquid diet so it was, he didn't have to take gallons and gallons of the clean prep type thing. Infusions, people have severe allergies and, and end up with post-traumatic stress. And so somebody mentioned, you know, um, doing yoga and meditation to try to like calm their the nerves um one person talked about when they go for ivs or blood work um and it was taught to her by another nurse is to wiggle her toes and be able to focus on that while the while it's happening so there's lots of different tips and tricks um that and we'll hear about more of them soon but i think ibd patients um i always think that people that live with chronic disease become creative problem solvers. And so you'll hear a lot of great tips from IV patients, but then you'll hear that it's actually reflected also in, in some of the research that's done and, can, and Dr. Hare will speak about that as well. Next slide. So this, um, I thought I would share my web of care and really to kind of give the big picture of sometimes what um, patients who live with chronic disease are dealing with. Um, and often, so being really at the center of this, the patient is the only constant in the care journey. 
They're the ones that experience the process and outcomes of care and often are the ones that are having to communicate and relay information amongst care providers, specialists, you know, all, all those different parts. So sometimes, you know, we might have our gastroenterologists that think, well, what's the big deal? You know, you've been in here, you know, for an MRI or um, an ileoscopy, you know, once this year. But in the big picture, we may have been doing a lot of other things that really creates a burden over time where sometimes we just get overwhelmed and we just need a break from all of it. And so it's just to kind of sort of have that reminder that it can be a lot managing and dealing with a chronic illness. And certainly there's times where I feel like I've got this, I can go in and handle all of it. And then there's times where I'm just like, I just want to break. I do not want to go in for any more infusions, any more tests. It's just so much. So, um, you know, I just think it's just good to keep that in the back of the mind that, you know, we're often dealing with a lot of different things, a lot of moving parts, um, and it can be um, feel burdensome to the patient at times. And, you know, I know here in Canada, and I'm, I'm pretty sure um, in the United States, there's a lot of disconnect in the healthcare system and often working in pillars. And so the patients have to really figure out how do I navigate this system? How do I get these people to talk to one another, you know, and understand that, you know, I have these different things going on and how can we work together as a team? So encouraging thing is a lot of the IBD um, specialized clinics are really folding in and, and creating these multidisciplinary teams. And so then you do have that communication. You have the different specialists that IBD patients um, require. And that, um, I mean, I, I go to an IBD clinic and it's amazing. It makes all the difference to know that you have this care team there for you. Next slide. Thanks, Sandra, so much for sharing your story and really highlighting how complex the cause is of anxiety in patients um, with IBD is. So we're gonna move on to some tips and tricks. One of the main tips, although admittedly often the most difficult, is to be open with your care team about concerns or discomforts. This was mentioned, I think, in both the last couple talks, that it's so important to really be open about those things. Um, a couple of things, for example, you may wanna to talk to your provider about different sedation options if you have a fear of waking up during the procedure or have a history of trauma. Consider asking to change clothes in a private room instead of behind the less than private curtains or ask for a robe to help maintain more privacy. You can ask for a warm blanket to either keep you warm in the often frigid procedure areas or you can wrap that warm towel around your arm uh, to help aid um, in IV placement and make it a bit easier. Finally, you can consider requesting changes if there's specific concerns or triggers present due to a history of trauma, including medical trauma. These can include voicing a gender preference for care team members or asking if a loved one or personal advocate can stay with you during the pre-op phase and be there when you wake up from sedation. Despite those things we just mentioned, there's still anxiety that can rear its ugly head. Cognitive or thinking strategies can help refocus thoughts that are based in fear and anxiety. Although these bothersome thoughts are normal and common, they're often based in negative thinking patterns and we wanna reframe, reframe that. The goal is to try and reframe those thoughts through this process. It's done in steps and it takes practice, but over time it becomes easier. Um, for example, we're gonna use the example thought, I'm going to pass out during my infusion very common thought. First, we want to identify that there's a bothersome thought causing anxiety or uneasiness. In this case, we want to recognize that the thought, I'm going to pass out during my infusion, is a thought that is predicting the worst. The second step is then to challenge the thought. For example, challenging the thought could be something like, I have never passed out before during an infusion, so it's unlikely that I will pass out during this one. Finally, we want to replace or reframe the thought with something more accurate. An example might be, this medication will help keep me feeling well, and there is excellent medical staff monitoring me during the infusion. 
these mental exercises are one tool that you can place in your toolbox of tricks. If you think exercises like this may be helpful for you as a tool, I would encourage you to reach out to a local GI behavioral health specialist or psychologist to help guide you in these exercises. So sometimes cognitive tricks aren't the right tool for the job. Are there things we can physically do to help reduce anxiety? Of course there are. One effective strategy is something called diaphragmatic breathing. The diaphragm is the muscle that contracts and relaxes when we breathe in and out. This breathing technique helps slow the heart rate and breathing rate and helps the body physically relax. In this type of breathing, the belly moves in and out instead of the chest rising and falling. There are numerous apps that can help teach you this technique and guide you in these exercises if you're interested. Distraction techniques are also very effective. Everyone is different and everyone's techniques of choice will certainly differ. A few options are listed on the slide here, but there is research to show that listening to music or looking at a relaxing picture reduce pre-procedural anxiety. The best part is that doing both appear to work better than only doing one. I would encourage you to find a couple things that you can keep tucked away in your toolbox of tricks and pull them out when needed. We've mentioned developing this, developing tools to put in your toolbox that can be used during times of anxiety. Uh, we're very fortunate here at the University of Michigan to have two behavioral health specialists, one of them being Dr. Jagelski, who spoke um, in the last couple sessions. I've also had the amazing opportunity to meet GI psychologists from all around the country and gain just a little bit of insight into the amazing things they have to offer patients. These professionals are excellent resources to help teach you some of those tools to store in your toolbox of tricks. We've again listed just a few of them that you may find useful here on the slide, but social media, blogs, and webinars like this one are great ways to learn about tools from fellow IBDers. As an IBD patient, you are thrust into countless anxiety-provoking situations. Every situation is not the same, and there may be different tool needed for those different jobs. So stock your toolbox up. I think so Sandra. In, yeah, and so in conclusion, um, know that you're not alone. Um, there's lots of ways to reach out and connect, whether it's with healthcare professionals, your gastroenterologist, psychologist, um, and or other IBD patients. Um, so that can be through social media. We have um, so many IBD patients that do some amazing work. Um, they have their own blog posts, sorry, blog posts, podcasts. We have Amber Tresca at, at uh, About IBD. Um, in Canada, we have Guts and Glory with Chantel Wicks um, and great resources. They, they do interviews with other IBD patients. Um, with gastroenterologists and um, IBD specialists. So um, if you're looking to learn and just even connect from, from afar, it's a great way to listen to, you know, what other people are going through. Um, organizations like Crohn's Colitis Foundation of America and Crohn's Colitis Canada, again, you know, in this virtual space, really, you know, I have access to, um, you know, join Crohn's Colitis uh, Foundation of America webinars and vice versa. Americans can come to this. Um, I know Crohn's Colitis Canada uh, has been uh, po or, or doing regular webinars with COVID-19 updates. And so actually to that matter, so is Crohn's Colitis Foundation of America. So, you know, you know, and there, there's just so much online right now, if you're feeling lost, that there's great resources, reputable resources that we can access. Twitter has a really great GI community where GIs and patients cross over and a lot of, you know, conversation amongst the community. So great learning space as well if, if you're looking for places to connect. Um, but really, again, back to reinforce um, Dr. Harris' comments about just really, um, you know, filling up your toolbox and you might use different tools at different times. Um, it's just a matter of, okay, so what am I dealing with today and how am I going to handle this situation and what's going to be the best for me right now? 
Some days you feel stronger than others. We're human beings that, you know, have various emotions. And sometimes, sometimes we feel we can tackle it. And other times we're feeling a bit more depleted and struggling a little more to handle certain situations. So that's when you need those tools. And thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Hickens, for the invitation to this wonder, wonderful event. Thanks so much. We have a question from Eric Doddy, and this comes up a lot. For the folks who have acute illness, it's very common to say, sure, I'll take any medicine. I want something to work. But what happens when once the person's better and they're sort of sitting there thinking about all the horrible things they read in the prescribing information? There's a small risk of lymphoma. There's a small risk of this. Um, the long-term anxiety about side effects related to IBD medications and the temptation to say, mm, maybe not, a, I'm not going to do this subcutaneous injection today because it's just freaking me out. Yeah, so uh, so I'll speak from my own personal experience and then Dr. Harris, you want to jump in and add to that. Um, so I learned the hard way, unfortunately, of how important medication is to to maintain stability and remission in my disease. I think part of, you know, I mean, we're very young when we're diagnosed. This is a young person disease for the most part. I was 19 years old. I really did not have an understanding. And I don't think those conversations happened at that time either of like the seriousness of the disease and those long-term effects um, and the impact that disease can have on you if left untreated over time. Um, I did not have a grasp on, you know, understanding that, how serious this, I had never heard of what Crohn's disease was and, and the impact it would have over a long period of time. So I learned the hard way. I got very, very ill. This is also pre-biologics, which for me has been a game changer. Everyone's an individual. Um, and, you know, that's a discussion to have between doctor and patient. But the way I look at it is the risk versus the benefits. And again, for me, the benefits way outweigh the risk like to have some normalcy and feel like um you know i can still live my life and have a medication that's helping me i feel like you know and this okay this is just my my way of looking at it but um i think the disease has changed my perspective in life and i feel like my quality of life versus quantity i'm not saying i want to die right away but quality of life is so important over, you know, that's how I kind of work it out in my head, I guess, is do I need to live to 100 or 95? Or do I want to live a quality of life over time? And versus struggling every day, because I've, I've lived that part of struggling every day and having to know where the washrooms are, live in pain and, and, ha and know what firsthand what that's like. So it, yeah, I just, um, the risk, are, are actually quite small when you, if you put it into like, how many people out of 10,000 people will, might get, you know, fill in the blank. Um, so that's another way I sort of look at it. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Hare? I think that's exactly what I was gonna say. I think the first thing is to be open with your, you know, care team about those concerns. Those are legitimate concerns. Most people going through treatment, like IBD patients do, have those concerns but unfortunately we get pamphlets of the side effects of the medication but not a pamphlet about the side effects of untreated disease and so i think it's important to talk with your physician because then they can highlight yes these are the risks of the medication but these are the risks of you know having untreated inflammatory bowel disease and then it allows the patient to make a more educated decision and maybe feel a little bit more empowered um, to go through with the therapy because it's not easy as every single talk today talks about these are big decisions and there's a lot of questions a lot of concerns and i think you know sandra when we were working through this presentation the theme that kept coming up was you know talk with your care provider about these concerns um, and make sure that they're aware um, don't sit there and suffer in silence with all these questions and concerns you have great yeah. And we are probably going to send you more questions through the question and answer portal. Uh, but at this point, I want to thank you both for a terrific presentation. It's been getting a great response on Twitter. Uh, people have really enjoyed this. And uh, I'm going to move on to our next sponsor talk. And um, 
we'll stop sharing the screen, see if I can pull this off, and um, move to uh, just our sponsor conversation with Wendy Jurasek. Uh, 